With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Heard Tell. Uh, welcome back to Heard Tell. I'm Andrew Donaldson joined once again with our friend Andrew Egger. He is a writer and editor with The Dispatch. You know him from other places previously, like the Weekly Standard, writing all over, doing a lot of really good work, and we're thrilled to have you back, sir. How are you? Hey, I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on again. Anytime. I uh, appreciate your time. All right. So you took one for the team. You went to CPAC, so we wouldn't have to. Uh, how was the trip to sunny Florida, my friend? I had never been to Orlando before. Uh, nice city, I think. I didn't see much of it other than my little uh strip you know between the hotel i was at and the hotel the event was at my hotel was right by sea world i could see the roller coasters from the front but i didn't get to go uh, i like roller coasters that made me kind of sad uh, but uh but when when your whole when your whole reporting trip is like at one hotel there's not really any reason to rent a car so you just you know you just uber back and forth so i was i was much more limited than i than i prefer to be so i can't i can't like give you you know a rundown of the city or anything like that but uh but you know it was sunny i uh i wore linen from time to time uh it's a nice it's a nice little trip um cpac also happened and i went to that too uh we may have to get you a seersucker suit for the next time you're down south my friend um <laughs> Yeah, let's just go there because we know what the national coverage was. There was a lot of headlines coming out of this, a lot of social media noise, a lot of uh, mainstream media coverage of this. What was it like in the rooms? Of course, it's a conference, so there's a lot of people there. There's different halls. There's different panels. There's the main speakers. What would you say the overall feeling in the room was, though, compared to the national coverage that we were seeing? So it's hard. It's always hard to get a bead on what exactly CPAC represents for exactly the reason that you mentioned that that most of the coverage um, is like, you know, the most explosive stuff. It's the most um, eye popping stuff. I'm sure we'll talk about some of that. Um, But but there's two reasons why that's the case. And one is that that's just always the case, you know, that, that, that media goes for what's most interesting. And oftentimes that's what's most sensational. And especially when when, you know, covering the right is concerned. But the other reason is just that other than the sensational stuff, the, the CPAC of today is, is more than anything, just kind of really boring. I mean, it's, it's, they, they kind of, there's a lot of kind of powerful people and prominent politicians and prominent, you know, um, media figures and things that speak, but they, uh, I, I don't know whether this is an, an organizing principle of, you know, the, the, the conference organizers that, that want it to be this way, or whether it's just, um, a, a speaking to the choir type event. And that's just sort of what, uh, the way it shakes out, but, but really it's, it's, uh, you get in there and it's, it's 25 people, or I guess 10 people in a day, uh, all doing kind of the same broad focus, Joe Biden jokes for kind of like panel after panel after panel on uh, ostensibly on, on all different issues, but it's, it's really, you know, oh, oh, your, your eyes glaze over for a lot of it because really it's there to be kind of infotainment more than anything else. They're not really there to, the, the, the speakers aren't there to break news. Um, they're not there to like kind of really drill down on any important topics. It's really just kind of this, um, this, we're all going to get together and we all like making fun of, of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and who all else. And so we're just going to do that for, for a, a few days. Um, and, and if insofar as news happens, it kind of is in, in the cracks and crevices between <laughs> that stuff, which is like 90% of the content. Yeah. And it, it didn't used to always be this way. Um, we've had some famous instances, of course, you know, the Trump era changed everything and it changed CPAC. And that's just one of the real visible things that changed it. Uh, we remember a couple of years ago, Mona Sharon famously getting booed off the stage at CPAC. You can pick a lot of instances like that, but it's, you know, we're in the writing business, you and me. Let's let's just be honest and grown up here for a second. I don't cover CPAC because I know what's going to be said for the mm-hmm. large extent. Now we have, you know, the Marjorie Taylor Greene kind of stuff. We'll get into that later. And of course, Trump's a live wire and you got to cover that. But even with Trump now, it's like we we've seen the movie. Isn't a lot of this just like it's a rerun of a rerun of a rerun at this point? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, well, so so you're you're absolutely right about that, which which I guess the 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 reverse of that is that if there's one thing that is useful about about CPAC is that because you kind of know 
where everybody's going to be coming from, like kind of the, the, the general flavor that everything's going to be, it can be useful as a temperature check if there's like something very new in the news, which actually, uh, I, I, I probably should have mentioned this in, in, when, when you asked a minute ago, but, but the, the most interesting thing for me uh, on, on that front was seeing the way in which various speakers kind of bounced off the, the uh, issues surrounding Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which was happening, uh, you know, basically began concurrent with CPAC. I can't remember exactly. I think maybe the night before was when, was when Russia really first went in. Uh, or maybe it was like the second day since, but it was all, it was all very fresh in the news still. And people were still figuring out, you know, what to think of all of this. Um, and, and so that when a lot of speakers, you know, just didn't touch it. Uh, Ron DeSantis was the first guy, uh, governor of Florida, first guy who spoke at the conference kind of opened the thing up and he just, he just didn't touch the topic. He just talked about what he wanted to talk about before. Um, but, you know, as the conference wore on, people had more time to kind of, uh, you know, rejigger their remarks and, 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 and figure out what they were going to say on Ukraine. And, and, and so that was one interesting thing was, was seeing kind of, there were kind of two camps that, that ended up developing on, on, uh, on the subject of how Americans and conservatives ought to feel about that conflict. Yeah. He's Andrew Egger from the dispatch, a uh, media professional who just executed a perfectly timed segue as we would call it into the Ukraine stuff. I was going to ask him about anyway. Well done. The Ukraine thing obviously was what, kind of started to dominate the national coverage you were in the hallways you're walking around you know conferences are more about rubbing elbows with people than sitting for the speakers in a lot of case did you talked about it this is a multi-day event people probably didn't really process it the first day or two because nobody knew what was going on and everybody had their priors which we know because there's a lot of notable media figures here which we won't delve into did you see a change through the weekend towards the ukraine situation was there a growing consensus that came out of this in the room? We know what the speakers were doing. And, and to be fair to the speakers, they have prepared remarks and stuff. So I'm I, day one, I'm not going to ding you too much on that. Did you see a shift as the week went on from the people attending? Um, it's, it's a little hard to say because everything is always kind of keyed when, when the speakers are, are talking keyed to like whatever iteration of an argument is going to elicit like an applause line or whatever. And, and, and it's a, it's a hometown crowd, you know, they're, they're, all the attendees are kind of kind of have in their mind, you know, we're conservatives. The speakers are conservatives. We're going to be like polite. We're going to, we're going to be enthusiastic, all these sorts of things. I do think on the first day, say, so, so on, on Thursday of last week, um, the first person who really, who kind of notably went into the Ukraine thing at all was Charlie Kirk, uh, turning point USA wonderkind Charlie Kirk, um, who his line essentially was, you know, what are we all doing even like caring about this thing that's happening all the way around the world uh, in, you know, places that we can't pronounce a uh, country we couldn't find on a map when, you know, we should really be paying attention to the crisis that's, that's unfolding at our Southern border. Um, and, you know, the, the Southern border matters a lot more than the Ukrainian border and that, that gets claps. Uh, but then, you know, later on, you have speakers talking about how much we really ought to care about that. KT McFarland and, and uh, Seb Gorka and Mark Levin, you know, talking about kind of the solidarity that we should have with another country attempting to be self-determining and, and, you know, exercise uh, democracy in some form, uh, even though obviously there's a lot of corruption in that country, but, but that these, this is a people that's sort of striving to be self-determining in ways that we should respect and admire uh, getting, invaded by an imperial power and that, that that's a thing we should care about whether it's halfway around the world or not that you know they get applause um i do think um there's two things that you can say i think and i, and I think it's it's basically a question of emphasis in in both in both respects because one uh anytime you got people whether it was charlie kirk or later on uh guys like matt gates and uh and uh, jd vance who were all making sort of this this point about proportionality that that you know, we really ought to care about these domestic issues more than these, uh, you know, international ones. When it's when it's phrased as kind of the the the, the comparison like that, they were going to get claps. And in fact, there was a there was a poll, the the CPAC straw poll that came out at the end of the end of the weekend. I think something like eighty percent of the recipients in that poll agreed that with the statement, you know, when you're comparing the two, the southern border is more important than the Ukrainian border to me as a as a citizen, whatever. Um, but that is not to say, uh, which I think some people thought going in, that there was like a significant like pro 
pro-Russia, pro-Putin uh, type contingent at CPAC. And I think the reason why a lot of people were were uh, expecting that is, you know, uh, for instance, Tucker Carlson on Fox has has been kind of like weirdly pro Putin for like a for a while, and he's obviously you know the most prominent prominent commentator on the network. And so I think a lot of the national media figures going into the conference kind of had that in the back of their minds that you know Trump likes Russia uh, or Trump likes Putin. Uh, Tucker Carlson likes Putin. Uh, Trump had made some comments, you know, calling Putin's invasion smart in, in certain ways. And so like there's there's this sense that like, oh, is the Republican Party sort of like pro-Russia now instead of pro pro this democratic uh, country of Ukraine, um, which kind of it just kind of fit in in sort of the the narratives that, that that these people were sort of building up for themselves. And I did not find that borne out at all, like at any point in time. Um, I think that any time uh, the speakers were talking about you know, Ukrainians right to be self-determining and, and our sort of uh, moral obligation, if not like policy obligation to, to like, at least, you know, intellectually support them to say nothing of supplying arms. Some, some, some speakers did say, you know, let's, let's send them all the arms they have so they can kill all these, you know, kill all these bastards that they can. Mark Levin said something like that got huge applause. Um, So I do think that, that, you know, even though you have seen, I think this this impulse in the Republican Party and the conservative movement to to sort of reorient just just as a matter of framing, OK, that stuff over there matters, but let's not lose track of this stuff at home. That doesn't mean that, like, if you're if you're just keeping score over there, the people would be anything other than sort of pro pro Ukraine and, and pretty strongly. So is it more fair, perhaps, than to get into the ideology of it, that there's certain people at CPAC and you just named them the Gateses of the world, these people, the Charlie Kirks of the world who you know, has the intellectual depth of a millimeter. Uh, is it fair to say like the national narrative, they're trying to apply a lot of policy stuff to this, but a lot of these guys, it really is just an applause line to them. Well, and it's, it's, it's an attempt to carve out like a, a sort of unique policy space because there's, there's this really, there's this real sense. I mean, n- nobody in Republican politics wants to be establishment at all ever. Right. I mean, that's just that. And that's not new. That, that goes back for a while. Um, but, but for some of these guys, uh, there is this real sense that that kind of like the worst establishment, like the most insidery beltway establishment you can be is uh, is like a neocon, like a hawk um, pro intervention in, in foreign wars. You know, the, the, the whole crowd who talks about endless wars and things like that, um, you know, not not <laughs> without reason, given c- some of the uh, catastrophic consequences of some of the interventions we've had in the past. But 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 it, it really is just sort of like a, an, an attempt to carve out. Uh, a, a specific uh, niche, I think, because there are a, a, a huge number of Republicans who sort of have that libertarian e impulse toward foreign conflict, where where you know they they themselves uh, don't think we should be getting embroiled in, in in conflicts around the world, but they kind of have this sense that maybe everybody else does, or maybe maybe if, if the if the libertarians aren't loud enough that that we're just going to because the the there's a foreign policy establishment in D.C. that that really wants to just kind of Im- embed itself in any conflict whatsoever. And so it's it's kind of a low cost way for guys like Gates and Vance to to um, to set themselves apart as as being kind of unique or, or, or good vessels to channel that energy um, because not other people, other people aren't doing it right now because it's so obvious that, that Putin is the aggressor and Ukraine is sort of being victimized. And, and so where everybody else is just kind of doing the, the natural, obvious human thing of, of speaking up in solidarity, they thus see an opportunity to kind of share, uh, ha- have, have a land to themselves, really, where they're still arguing something defensible, uh, uh, arguably defensible that, you know, at the very least, we should be, you know, uh, sticking up for, we, we shouldn't, we shouldn't be, uh, participating in foreign policy at the expense of domestic policy. Uh, but they're really the only, the only real reason to go there is like you say, to, to have the sort of political payoff. Yeah. Talking to Andrew Egger. Uh, when we come back more CPAC reacts, uh, the main event, Donald Trump was there. He got asked the question about Ukraine, which side he was on. He answered with a resounding yes. And how do you solve a problem like Marjorie Taylor green more with Andrew Egger of the dispatch on her tell right after this. Ah, welcome back to Herd Tell. Our friend Andrew Egger, uh, the Dispatch, does good work there, writing and editing and doing all sorts of things. And he did God's work by going to CPAC, so we didn't have to. Okay, the main event, 
at CPAC for the last couple of years has always been Donald J. Trump, the former president of the United States, uh, well received as he always is. But then he he didn't have any fear of those early speakers. He waded knee deep into the Ukraine thing. The interesting part, and you wrote about it at the dispatch, everybody should go and read it, was he took a look at the political arguments on both sides. He took a look at his own history on both sides, and he said yes. And he straddled that fence for a good 20, 25 minutes worth of speaking time, didn't he? Yeah, well, it, so it's in in some respects, it's nice no longer to be the president when there's crises that are happening, right? Because because whatever whatever it is that you're going to say, the first and last thing you're going to say is, well, you know, I obviously would have handled this better. Like we all know Biden's doing badly and I would have done better. Probably if I were president, Putin never would have invaded at all, he basically said. Um, but but the what we were just talking about with the kind of two sides of this of this Ukraine question, what was really interesting all through Trump's presidency was how both of these sorts of constituencies constantly claimed him as their own. You know, um, he he would talk about uh you know, the need to get out of uh, of the Middle East, the need to get out of Afghanistan, the need to wrap up our, our endless wars. Um, but then he would also uh, occasionally zag away from that. And and, you know, he ordered the strike that that killed Qasem Soleimani. He ordered, you know, various uh, retaliatory strikes throughout his presidency. Uh, pretty intense sanction regime here and there on on various uh, hostile powers. Um, and so you know, there, there was always enough stuff where both uh, hawks and doves and the Republican Party could kind of lay claim to Trump as their own, which was helpful for everybody because everybody always wanted to be on Trump's side uh, in Republican politics because he was uh, incredibly popular among Republican voters. And we basically saw that again with this Ukraine uh, or with his speech on Saturday night in which he he uh, dwelt on Ukraine at, at, at some length. On the one hand, he was castigating President Biden for getting out of Afghanistan uh, and 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 basically saying that that, you know, by doing that, he had kind of greenlit Putin to go back into uh, or to go into Ukraine without without consequences. And then he, he even sort of laughed off the notion that that these economic sanctions that a bunch of governments have been putting on Russia, which are not small. I mean, they're, they're kind of really stringent economic measures that the, the world is, has been responding uh, to this invasion with, surprisingly so, for a lot of people. Um, but he kind of laughed those off. He said, uh, the NATO nations and indeed the world, and I'm, just, I'm just quoting this now, the NATO nations and indeed the world, as Putin looks over what's happening strategically with no repercussions or threats whatsoever, they're not so smart. They're looking the opposite of smart. If you take over Ukraine, we're going to sanction you, they say. Sanction? Well, that's a pretty weak statement. Putin is saying, oh, they're going to sanction me. They sanctioned me for the last 25 years. You mean I can take over a whole country and they're going to sanction me? You mean they're not going to blow us to pieces, at least psychologically? And and they've so far allowed him to get away with this travesty and assault on humanity, which is I mean, this really strong language. I mean, it's like this this universalizing language that that Putin is not just kind of invading uh, invading a neighboring country, not just like trying to reclaim uh, some people who are like culturally Russian anyway, or, you know, so, some of the ways that, that, that people have tried to minimize this, but here's, you know, Donald Trump saying that this attack is an assault on humanity. Um, but then at the same time, uh, he, he later in the speech kind of goes, goes back to the, he doesn't ever actually say endless wars or anything like that, but he, he, he goes back to that. Uh, he, he does a victory lap on, on that side of things, too. He says, you know, I, I, I wasn't the president who, like, got us into more wars. I was the president who ended wars. And, and in fact, there was a lot of continuity between Trump's Afghanistan policy and Biden's Afghanistan policy. Trump had already kind of, like, set us on the road to that withdrawal that Biden then carried out. So it was just sort of like this weird thing where, where Trump is almost argue, like almost arguing with his own foreign policy in the speech. And nobody really kind of calls him out on this in kind of Republican foreign policy world, because there's not really any incentive to, for the reason I, I mentioned before, which is that everybody would just prefer to just say, well, look at this thing Trump said, he's clearly a hawk, or look at this thing said, he's he, this thing Trump said, he's clearly a dove, and and uh, and just kind of keep laying claim to him as their own. If, if he were still president, we would be able to kind of set all that aside and judge judge what was happening based on his what he was actually carrying out, you know, whether he was being more hawkish or dovish in this instance. But he was asked in an interview, I think I can't remember this before his speech or after, but but point blank asked, you know, what w- what would you be doing differently? What should Biden be doing differently? He's like and he, he gave like one of the classic dodges of all time where he's like, 
well, you know, I, uh, I, I, I can't really say, I shouldn't really say in case any policymakers want to come, you know, uh, asking my opinion, I, I shouldn't put it out there publicly, which is the sort of thing he would do all the time as president and kind of made sense when he was actually president. And, and, you know, it, maybe it would make sense to, to keep some of these actual decisions uh, close to the chest, but, but was pretty plainly just kind of blowing smoke now. Uh, the other headlining person after Donald Trump, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene. I'm not going to take the time to dig into it. If you don't know who Nick Fuentes is, Google it with your uh, security settings on maximum, please, because he is a, a despicable human being who has long been shunned by anybody who has the ability to read. He's that bad, folks. I'm not overstating it. She spent part of her CPAC weekend over at his conference across the street. I don't buy her answer because you can never get a member of Congress to go anywhere without pre-planning. She took lots of photos with him before, during, and after the speech. You can look up what she said at the speech itself and her tepid response. My question with this is, <laughs> if I'm the CPAC folks, why did this not upset them? And the fact that it didn't upset them and they can't even respond on the record. I'm, I'm talking to people like Matt Schlepp and these folks whose name are attached to CPAC. What is it? What should we read from that? Because it seems pretty apparent to me to read from that is like you're, you're either scared to say anything about it or you're OK with her doing it. I don't really see a real third option here. Do you? Yeah, I mean, I, I I think the most charitable thing that you could say about uh, Schlapp and ACU is that and 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 CPAC institutionally is that it took them by surprise. Um, they it was it was the night before. I mean, Marjorie Taylor Greene was uh, publicly scheduled to speak at CPAC. Uh, I I can't remember if it was Friday or Saturday morning. Now I guess it was Saturday morning. Um, and and that had been you know she'd been announced for days. It, it, she was always going to be there. She was just on a panel. She wasn't like a headline speaker or anything like that. But, you know, she's a very prominent person uh, in in kind of uh, grassroots land, the conservative media landscape. And uh, and the night before that uh, was this America First political action conference uh, that uh, of Nick Fuentes's. And she had not been scheduled to speak there. She had not been announced um, she was a, a surprise guest um, and, and she came up and she talked to them and uh, and it was live streamed. So it goes out the night before. And that puts uh, that puts CPAC in a bind. Right. Because suddenly they can't sort of set this thing to the side. They can't sort of remain apart from uh, the AFPAC stuff. They have to really sort of make a judgment one way or the other, whether whether they're going to just sort of like a, let Marjorie Taylor Greene say her piece and then as far as they're concerned, forget it ever happened, <laughs> forget she ever spoke at, at AFPAC or anything like that, or cancel her, right? I mean, take her, take her off stage. And and there's hardly anything that you can do that's that's more unforgivable in Republican Party politics these days than be seen as an agent of cancellation, be seen as someone who's shutting down speech, right? Um, now, CPAC themselves, uh, they plainly do not, uh, Matt, Matt Schlapp doesn't support Nick Fuentes. Um, in fact, for years, uh, Fuentes and, and his his goons have been banned from from CPAC. And they I mean, they've they've tried to make a stink at the at the event a number of times. Uh, they've, you know, marched in and gotten themselves kicked out uh, on a few occasions. The whole the whole, the whole existence of AFPAC uh, is supposed to be kind of like a, a white nationalist protest against uh, kind of ossified institutional conservatism in their minds that CPAC represents, right? Um, so it's not like they're they're making common cause, <laughs> Matt Schlapp and, and Nick Fuentes in any way. But by virtue of the fact that like Marjorie Taylor Greene had committed to CPAC and then went back the other way, that's that's where where then if you're Schlapp, you're in your own sort of personal uh, cost benefit analysis, you, you're kind of stuck with no good options. And obviously it's, you know, us as third party observers sitting here, it's easy to say, well, there was a, a good option, which is to cut Marjorie Taylor Greene off at the knees. Um, and, and that that would have been, you know, the thing to do if if what you care about is, you know, the health of the movement and and things like that. Basically, any anybody that touches Nick Fuentes, who, white nationalist, uh, is immediately not welcome back in, in non white nationalist conservative circles. Right. I mean, that's 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 a functional a functional movement would would operate according to rules like that but uh insofar as that's a rule of the modern conservative movement it is at least a secondary rule because the the primary rule and we saw this um is always just don't 
become don't ever be on the same side as the cancelers, as the media, as the Democrats. Um, and so when Marjorie Taylor Greene shows up at at CPAC after being at AFPAC and it, it's immediately like a press story, um, people are like, whoa, because like, uh, it's crazy that that happened um, and it gets covered. And then it immediately because it's getting covered, it enters into this very familiar cycle of are we going to are we going to cancel her? Or are we going to you know let her have her free speech or whatever? Um, and, and, and obviously, if you're Matt Schlapp, the, the, the safest play in order to avoid offending anybody you actually care about, which is potential CPAC uh, attendees uh, or current CPAC attendees, is just to go to ground and, and kind of ignore the, the thing altogether. But that's the problem here, talking to Andrew Yeager. Uh, the buzzword of cancel culture, which everybody likes to wield like a weapon, like their brave heart running across the open field to go fight the English. They want to yell cancel culture. The problem is at some point you have to be able to police your own and have some accountability or you are lumped in with those people. And everybody who's not, you know, died in the wolves, CPAC, conservative, whatever term you want to use here to lump those people all together. If you got one of them in there, you're going to get lumped in with them to the you're marginalizing yourself by not policing your own and holding your own accountability. They've really got themselves a mess here with her. Um, to a lesser extent, Gates, who came out and support her. Gosser spoke to these folks last year. It was the same thing again. There's going to be somebody next year probably do it again if they don't get a claim. The re- the CPAC and that side of the Republican Party's got a real problem on their hands where they've put themselves in a position. You just said it. They don't seem to be able to police anything in and of themselves. So they're gonna they're going to marginalize themselves going forward. Are they not? Well, it's just it's it's remarkable how quickly this sort of thing has has sort of overtaken uh, not just sort of CPAC, but kind of the whole the whole Republican Party. I mean, it was only a couple of years ago that that uh, Steve King, the congressman from Iowa at that time, said said some I mean, who, who you know had a long history of kind of incendiary comments about immigrants and things like that. But but he, he said something that that was a little too close to the line of sort of like white nationalism. And there was a huge upheaval within the party. Um, at that time, majority leader, majority leader Kevin McCarthy uh, took action against him, stripped him of his committee assignments, um, and he was gone from Congress shortly after that because he was successfully primaried because nobody wants a, a congressman who has no power and doesn't sit on any committees and can't get anything done. Um, but that was just a little bit ago. I mean, and now uh, what we saw from Marjorie Taylor Greene, you know, she did not in 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 speech. Uh, endorsed white nationalism or anything like that. But she, you know, very plainly uh, showed up alongside this guy uh, at his conference, made common cause and and only kind of very half heartedly walked it back. Paul Gozar, like you say, spoke there last year. He spoke there again this year in a, in a video conference. Uh, he what didn't attend, but he called in uh, and we're not seeing it yet, at least so far, any kind of institutional retribution uh, from from their bosses in Congress at all. Um, and, and we're unlikely to see, uh, anything like that. And, 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 you know, when, when that, when even that kind of final guardrail, I mean, it, you just, it just seems like you're kidding yourself, uh, to, to, to think if you're Kevin McCarthy or, or Matt Schlapp or any of these guys, that if you just kind of keep your head in the sand long enough, the problem will go away. I mean, I guess at least if you are Matt Schlapp, the longer you keep your head in the sand, the more successive years CPAC is a big money maker for your organization. Um, so there's that. Uh, I don't, I don't know what Kevin McCarthy's thinking that that consideration doesn't, doesn't really play in for him. Kevin's thinking he's going to get some knives in the back come January if they get the majority, but we'll talk <laughs> about that as we get closer to it, my friend. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a bad say. And then you get her heckling at the state of the union because you've never told her to sit down and shut up. So now she's going to yell whenever she feels like it real quick, Andrew Eger, before we let you go, you were in the halls. You talk to people behind the scenes. You've talked to staffers. Uh, the thing about CPAC is, is there's just a lot of people in the same place to kind of get a temperature check. Like you said, uh, Trump was there. Is he running? What do they think? Oh, it really seems like he is. I mean, I don't think he himself has decided yet, but he that's where all the that's all the momentum is moving that direction. It seems like it seems like he with, with Biden kind of suffering in the polls, uh, I, I think the and, and looking like a really vulnerable candidate potentially in 2024, I think he would love nothing more than to get a rematch against him. And if it's not Biden, if, if, you know, uh, it's Kamala Harris or something like that, I so much the better even. I mean, I think, I think he has said things in recent months that, that 
have caused some people to perk up their ears and be like, maybe, maybe he, what he really wants is to be a Kingmaker this time around and, and kind of throw his weight behind a guy and kind of win vicariously through them. But I, but that didn't, that wasn't what it sounded like uh, when he spoke. And that's not kind of the, 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 that's not where the momentum is in, in his camp. I think, I think I would be surprised if he didn't run again in 2024. Yeah, he's he actually read up on some foreign policy that always perks my ear up. Like, uh oh, he actually studied something. Pay attention to this, Andrew mm-hmm. Egger. Uh, appreciate all the hard work on this. You wrote four separate pieces over CPAC, so you got good content out of it. If nothing else, at the dispatch, make sure you check them out. Let folks know where they can find the dispatch and follow you on social media and everywhere else you got going on, my friend. Yeah, you bet. Just the dispatch.com, uh, articles, newsletters, podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. Um, you could follow me on Twitter if you feel like it at Egger DC, although you won't get much out of me, uh, for a little while. Cause I'm off of it for Lent. Um, and, uh, and yeah, that's, uh, so you'll, if, if, if you're, if you want more of this, I guess you'll just have to, you'll have to go the institutional route to the dispatch.com. <laughs> Don't worry us Baptists will hold Twitter down until y'all get done with your Lent stuff. Yeah, we'll right, be here right. for you, my friend, uh, Andrew Egger will happily have you back whenever you got stuff going on. Appreciate your time, my friend. All right. Thanks for having me on. Thank you, sir.